Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Welcome everybody, I'm Dr. Ben White and welcome to the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting tonight. I'm very excited that we have Karen, Dr. Karen Duncan joining us for what should be a fascinating discussion about a functional medicine approach to Parkinson's disease. We have all probably heard quite a bit about a functional medicine approach to Alzheimer's disease with Dr. Dale Bradison, Dr. Karazian, Dr. Perlmutter speaking and writing about this, but I feel that Parkinson's disease is a forgotten neurodegenerative condition. And this is why I'm so excited to take a deep dive into how we can help patients with Parkinson's disease with a natural approach. I want this meeting to be interactive, so please participate by typing your questions into the chat box, and then I'll either call on you or ask Dr. Duncan your question when it's appropriate. And um, I hope that you'll consider joining some of our future meetings. April 27th, uh, Fiona McCullough is going to join us from Canada for a discussion on menopause and hormone replacement. May 25th, uh, Dr. Mark Pimentel will join us, and uh, he apologizes for missing last month's meeting. He'll be joining us for a discussion on SIBO and IBS we haven't figured out June, but July 27th, Dr. Bredesen will be joining us for a discussion on Alzheimer's disease. And if you're not aware, we have a closed Facebook page, the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica, uh, that you should join. And if you're listening out there, this page is just for practitioners, so we can continue this conversation when this evening is over. I'm recording this event, I'll include it in my weekly Rational Wellness podcast, which you can subscribe to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness podcast, please give me a five-star ratings and review. Now, um, uh, I want to thank our sponsor for this evening, Integrative Therapeutics, um, and Steve Schneider, who normally comes and tells us about a few of their products, is unable to join us because he got tickets to go watch UCLA in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> I'm jealous. But I want to tell you about a few integrative therapeutic products. They have a great brain formula called Neurologix, which is a non-stimulant nootropic supplement for enhanced cognitive performance. It contains Numetix spearmint extract, which contains phenolic compounds for sustained mental focus and to support working memory. It contains cognizant citicoline to support brain energy metabolism, enhance frontal lobe bioenergetics, and increase ATP levels in the brain, and saffron extract, which supports positive mood. And they also have a great highly absorbable curcumin product, thuracurmin, which is a water-soluble form. And there's actually been a lot of research done using this particular product. One of the advantages is you get a therapeutic dosage with only two capsules a day. And there's studies showing that it uh, reduces dementia and promotes brain health. Um, our speaker for this evening, Dr. Karen Duncan, is a board-certified naturopathic physician with a focus on integrative neurology, and she's a specialist in treating patients with Parkinson's disease using an integrative functional medicine approach. Dr. Duncan practices at Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ben. Thanks for being here, everyone. Absolutely. So um, how did you first become interested in treating patients with Parkinson's disease? Well, you know, my mom used to tell me as a kid, 18 words or less, because I was a chatter. So <laughs> <laughs> if I get going here too, just throw something at me. Uh, you know, long story short, I actually became a caregiver at the age of 14 for my dad who had a neurologic condition uh, in 2014. 
for 25 years um, kind of advocated for him in the conventional realm and, and worked with physicians and had this really deep uh, passion for neurology. And then when I went to school, I knew I wanted to focus on it. And I met Lori Mishley and she is really the one out there spearheading the research. She's funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, NIH. She presents at the World's Parkinson's Congress every year. Um, so at the beginning of every talk, I always want to say, I don't have any conflict of interest. I just have this incredible relationship with this woman who's really spearheading the integrative approach for Parkinson's. Um, and she invited me to be a part of the Parkinson's disease summer school uh, through Bastyr University, my alma mater and Kenmore. And on day one, I said, you know, hey, Lori, I don't know how you do what you do. All you see is people with Parkinson's. Don't you get bored? And she was just like, give it a week. And at the end of that first week, I went up to her with tears in my eyes. I'm like, this is what I want to do. It was such a profound experience for me to witness these people come in, share their stories, recognize that no two um, people were the same with Parkinson's disease. Um, there's so much promise in the therapeutics that we're doing. So it was exciting to, to join the team. And then the longer I do it, the more the more I enjoy it. So neurology has been in my blood since I was young. And, and here I am. <laughs> That's great. So what is Parkinson's disease? How is it defined? How do we diagnose it? Oh, well, really, I love to uh, take this opportunity to open up to the crowd. If anybody wants to tell me what they think Parkinson's disease is, I'd love to hear um, somebody else's definition. I guess the, the simple degeneration of the or lack of dopamine is substantia nigra and any disease or entity can affect that. That's kind of my very light definition. Yeah, I like that one. And what you'll hear in most conventional terminology, or if you Google Parkinson's disease, right, it's your your four symptoms, the bradykinesia, the stoop posture, the, the masked facies, um, and the, the roll, the pill rolling tremor. Um, and when I talk to my patients or when I talk on these lectures, I always like to say when Parkinson's disease is diagnosed dependent on motor symptom presentation, Right, because we're diagnosing it based on motor symptom presentation, but the research is showing that Parkinson's disease can start as early as 10 to 20 years prior uh, in the human body. So it is, in, in short, the degeneration or the death of dopaminergic neurons, um, but the symptom presentation that we're looking at and how we're defining it by autopsies is really far off. And I think, you know, Ben and I have talked before, until we redefine what that looks like for people so we can recognize it earlier, uh, we're going to be stuck in this hamster wheel of, of being too late to the diagnosis. Yeah. And I, I think the most common symptom people think about is the tremor. And, and that's actually not something that always occurs and sometimes occurs quite late, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we're what we're recognizing is that by the time of diagnosis, depending on motor symptom onset, the the substantia nigra is 70 to 80 percent deplete in dopamine already. So by the time the motor symptoms show up, we are we're so late to the game. Right now, what are some of the common symptoms that happen early? Uh, patients often have constipation. I understand that's a big thing. And, you know, I was thinking about the fact that one of the other uh, early, early symptoms is a loss of taste. And now we've got all these patients out there who've had COVID and they have a loss of sense of smell and taste. Yeah, that that one kind of bit me in the ass, Ben, because I was I was lecturing and raising awareness about actually the loss of sense of smell is what we recognize in people with Parkinson's. Not oh, so the much sense of smell. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, some anosmia early on, um, and when COVID happened, you know, I'm out there lecturing, saying if you have this triad of of non motor symptoms, constipation, anosmia, and REM sleep disorder, we need to treat you as if we would treat somebody who is a risk for heart attack. Right? You're sedentary. You're a smoker. You're, you're heavy overweight. Um, and so when I started lecturing about that and then COVID happened, you should have seen the messages. Oh my God, I lost my sense of smell. Am I going to get Parkinson's disease? So, um, but yes, when we look at that, that those are the kind of the triad of symptoms that we're really trying to stand on the rooftop and say, if we are all aware that this triad of non-motor symptoms predates the diagnosis by up to 10 to 20 years, and we do something about it, could we actually cure Parkinson's disease? I mean, that's the big question, right? If we can slow those inflammatory processes down and treat those, would it continue to degenerate? And of course, we don't know the answer yet because we're not doing it. Um, 
that is, you know, it's a huge passion of mine. I have, I would say five to seven patients in my practice right now that I've identified and actually had that conversation with and said, Hey, you're meeting these like risk factors. And, you know, most of them have somebody in their family who's had Parkinson's or a neurologic condition. We're seeing vitamin D deficiencies. So as, as things are piling up in the investigative work, I'm sitting them down and saying, I want to be really upfront with you because I'm passionate about this. I'm not saying you're going to get it. I don't have my crystal ball, but here's what I know. And I'd be doing a disservice if we didn't address this. So, you know, one of the really interesting ones is the constipation, which indicates that there's some gut imbalance, gut dysbiosis. What have you found is something that might make sense as an intervention? Uh, do you find some of these patients have methane SIBO or what what do you or what would be the kind of intervention that might make a difference? Can I just say yes? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, any and all. I mean, we're finding so many um, GI dysfunction and inflammatory conditions in people with Parkinson's and they're extreme. You know, they're really severe. I have a patient who he can't sit down and watch a movie with his family just because of his gut inflammation and pain. And so to kind of get to, to roll back, because I, as I understand it, Ben, and clear, these are all medical professionals here on this call, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to get a little nerdy here for a second. Great. Um, the, the inflammation in the intestines you know, when the intestines are inflamed at ages studied as young as five years old, we're seeing when the intestines are inflamed, they release a protein into the bloodstream. And the name of that protein is alpha synuclein. And if you're familiar at all with the pathology of Parkinson's disease and autopsies of the people with Parkinson's, we're finding this misfolded alpha synuclein, you know, aggregated in the substantia nigra. And so all of these pharmaceutical targets are how do we get rid of alpha synuclein? How do we get rid of this? But really the question is, why is it there to begin with? And it's an intentional compensatory response mechanism from the intestines saying, SOS, we're, we're pissed. We're going to send out off a synuclein. And then, you know, anybody who wants to yell out to mute, you know, what's the nerve that connects the gut and the brain, right? We know the vagus nerve is doing that. There's a huge hypothesis that's being accepted in the conventional world that that, that protein can travel up and then the, um, vagus nerve originates near the substantia nigra and deposit there. So when we're, when we're looking at gut health and PD and, you know, we could take the rest of the hour talking about it and I'll, I'll try not to <laughs> so throw something at me if I just keep going. Um, and you know, I would it, definitely, that's a rabbit hole. I, I would like to travel down as well. Well, it is, you know, and I, and I pump the brakes and so many people will come into me and say, Hey, I want to work on my Parkinson's disease. What meds should I take? What do I do for my brain? And I say, <clears throat> I think I told you this before, Ben, excuse me. I consider it borderline malpractice to prescribe somebody an oral medication that they cannot absorb. If their gut is that inflamed and they are resistant to the use of oral medications, then I pump the brakes. And as frustrating as it may be for patients to hear, wait, I'm not seeing an improvement in my symptoms yet. I kind of will say, hey, stand by. And what I'm noticing in my patient population is once we treat the gut, whether it be SIBO or IBS, Crohn's, um, you know, I mean, IBD, Crohn's, things like that, uh, or just your run-of-the-mill low gastric motility because of autonomic dysfunction, we are actually seeing a drop in the need for cinnamon or carbidopa levodepa by up to 30 to 50%. So operating well, lower symptom presentation with a lower dose of the medicine that their neurologists are pretty much maxing them out on and saying, you're done. This is the end of the efficacy. So that gut health, it just, it's, you know, it, it has to be first because that's where we're getting all of the effect of our, of our medicine and you our know, nutrients. I got to get my megaphone. Um, Researchers on Parkinson's, uh, before we spend the next 20 years develop, spending billions and billions of dollars developing drugs, blocking the formation of this alpha-synuclein protein, take a look at the research on Alzheimer's. And even though they have drugs that clear out um, the amyloid plaque, it doesn't cure Alzheimer's and a lot of the patients get worse. So before we make the same mistake with Parkinson's and spend billions and billions of dollars trying to block with this one protein. Understand why the body's making it. Exactly. I mean, in the beauty of the human body, right? When you really, when you really sit there and think about it, it's just, it's this gorgeous process that the body's saying, we're putting out our distress signal. Why aren't you listening? And we're like, let's kill your distress signal. 
you know, Some, it, somebody asked about alpha, the, the protein I just mentioned, Dr. Duncan just mentioned that uh, a lot of the, some of the drugs for, um, uh, for Parkinson's are designed to clear out this alpha synuclein protein. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds very much like the Alzheimer's story in, in that sense. And there are already billions in Ben, honestly. So yeah, oh, I'm sure. Now it, it's interesting. You mentioned that we should be treating this like heart disease in terms of prevention, and I was digging through some of the research on um, Parkinson's today uh, in between patients, and um, <clears throat> I I saw several articles showing that lower levels of cholesterol are actually. Um, related to um, increased risk of Parkinson's and taking statins seems to increase the risk of Parkinson's. So maybe we don't want to treat it the way we treat heart disease. No, we don't want to. I don't want to take a similar approach. Right. You, know, you, could, you could pick anybody off the side. No, 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 I know. I know. I know what you're saying. <laughs> no, I just wanted, I just wanted to point that out that that's really interesting that um, cholesterol, which I think most of us in the functional medicine world know it's super important for brain health. Yep. Uh, and yet, you know, the uh, conventional cardiology world would tell us that cholesterol um, is um, in, that lowering cholesterol through taking statins has no effect on brain health at all. Um, I recently heard um, a very popular podcast host um, uh, who talks a lot about cardiovascular disease saying the goal should be to get ApoB or LDL-C uh, down to like 30 or 40. Just drive it as low as possible using whatever pharmaceuticals are necessary and um, claiming that there's no problem with brain health because the brain produces its own cholesterol. Yeah, you know, and, and it's, you can get even more detailed than that, but yeah, the cholesterol levels are really important. And, you know, I'm a huge proponent of collegiality and I, and I've reached out to cardiologists time and again, and I've only gotten pushed back once to be honest. So it's just, you know, I really want to be a sounding board to say and like bridge the gap, have the conversations, alleviate patient advocacy, pick up the phone and call the team. You know, it's, it's such a great way to connect um, with that patient's team. I'm a huge proponent of patient advocacy, but when I talk to this cardiologist, I'm saying, Hey, that's what the research is showing here. I, I respect what you're doing. I understand what you're doing. Can we set a goal? You know, and in the lab research that we're finding, um, the cholesterol goal of 150 to 175 is really as low as we want to go. Um, so when you set that goal out there, I, like I said, I've only had pushback once and it's, Hey, yeah, let's set this goal. Let's lower the risk for statin. What are you doing over there? We're doing diet and lifestyle. And we have red yeast rice on board, or we have some other, you know, botanicals and, and Hey, can we recheck in six months? and then collaborate and see if you feel comfortable with the plan. Um, and it's it's a really effective conversation. And like I said, I, I just don't get pushback. They're most of the time, and I'm not taking anything away from, you know, they prescribe it and then they refill it. And then there's not really that follow through. So when you bring their attention to, hey, you know, patient A's cholesterol is at 110 and they're really <laughs> declining here. We need to, we need to reduce that. Um, and then when you talk about, you know, cholesterol in the brain and, and fat and everything like that, you know, that's really what we want to be supporting and, and supplementing with if we need to. So um, we know that it, there's lots of environmental triggers that can uh, trigger um, the onset or make Parkinson's worse. W what are some of the most important environmental triggers? You know, some of the ones that are proven, you know, as a dry cleaning agent, um, and then there's a, a toxin. And I think I stumbled on this last time you asked me, you think I'd be more prepared, prepared but um, <laughs> there's a toxin in the Navy that was used in Navy yards and on Navy ships that has been a, a known causative now, it's not even correlative for Parkinson's disease. Um, other minor factors, you know, pesticides, glyphosate is out there. Um, there's some theories on mycotoxins. There's a lot of theories on mycotoxins. I right. just, anybody want to send me a link for a lab that you at true blue and accurate and hasn't changed their reference ranges in the last two years, I'd love to see it. Um, Cause those are tough ones to test. And then you repeat testing in the lab, change their reference range or, you know, what is normal. So, um, 
with that, there's there's kind of but there's a ton of well, what 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 lab do you like for toxins and mycotoxins? We I most consistently use Great Plains. Okay. That's usually the one that I'll use for that one. Um, environmental or sorry, elemental toxins or um, when I'm looking at the essential toxins or toxic minerals, I use a doctor's data. Okay. Yeah, we've been using Vibrant. They have a total tox burden that includes yeah. like 20 heavy metals, a bunch of environmental toxins, and mycotoxins all through urine. Great. No, I'd I'd love to learn more about you know testing is. There's so many out there. It's trying to know what's best, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at there. And an interesting thing on the toxin thing, you know, Ben, I, I think I told you this too, but you know, back in, in school, you take this environmental medicine class, right. And everybody leaves, like, I'm not touching anything. I'm not going to breathe the air. I'm not going to go out of my, you know, I'm be a bubble boy. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, was a little older. I went through med school. I had been in the military and I was like, well, I'm screwed. <laughs> like, I had every, every toxin out there. Toxic that burn to. pits. And yeah. yeah. So when I'm looking at, it, I'm saying, what can we do to enhance the terrain of the body to eliminate toxins? Right. And a really interesting fact is, like I said, by time of diagnosis, because of motor symptom onset, if we're 80% deplete in dopamine, we also have evidence that shows we're 40 to 60% deplete in glutathione. And glutathione is a primary antioxidant of the central nervous system. So in layman's terms, what I tell my patients is if you have this degenerative disease because of the death of dopaminergic neurons, and we know that when cells die and go through apoptosis, they release, you know, their toxins into the environment or the debris, which causes oxidative stress on neighboring cells that creates a domino effect or a faster progression of the disease. Now we don't have the dump truck, right? We don't have the thing that's going to come clean it up. So it's perpetuating that, that pathophysiology there, if you will. So when we talk about toxic burden, it is really important to recognize what each patient has, one for diagnosis confirmation, because there's been a handful of people that I've undiagnosed with IPD to Parkinsonism based on heavy metal toxicity or, or toxic burden, um, but also for treatment. Many of the people with Parkinson's that walk into my practice aren't vital or resilient enough to even go through the detox process if they are burdened. So it's nice to know but it's also, in my opinion, more important to, you know, boost up that, that vitality and the resilience of the patient and their, in their physiology, say, what's your glutathione levels? How can we help your liver support? Of course, that brings us back to the GI, right? Are you pooping? If you're right. not getting rid of your toxic waste products, then we need to work on those emunctories first. And, and those are part of most functional medicine detox programs anyway. Right, exactly. But I, I've seen, you know, and I've I've had patients come in who've been through detox protocols and they just weren't ready for it yet. And they get, you know, really sick and it can aggravate Parkinson's. It's inflammatory. So we have to be really cautious with this population, how hard we go into any treatment. I mean, right. even something as, as relatively benign as SIBO um, can really put a, a, a dent in the Parkinson's symptoms. And when it's degenerative, we we want to weigh that risk very carefully. Yeah. And I think the strategies that are going to tend to really make patients worse are when we're using like these oral chelating agents or IV chelating agents. I think, you know, the more modern approach is to use liposomal glutathione and maybe some binders and, and, and liver support and things to support bile production. Broccoli and selenium, Ben. I there mean, don't go. underestimate those types of things too that can yep. really help with that that removal of those toxins. Now, um, I've also seen some data that viral infections like Epstein-Barr can uh, be triggers for Parkinson's. And interesting now, coming back to the, that we've been through this pandemic and um, we're finding that um, reactivation uh, of dormant uh, viral infections like Epstein-Barr are very common uh, for patients as part of the long COVID process. Yep. I mean, in my opinion, and I won't dive into the long COVID thing because that's a whole, you know, another podcast. Um, but in my opinion, what I am seeing is that's what we're missing. The In the biggest sphere of, of medicine in general is we're missing what else once we get to a diagnosis and I do this lecture to my patients so many times and you know online forums is once you get this diagnosis of Parkinson's we'll stick to that it's really easy then for everybody to grab this big umbrella and say oh you're not pooping that's Parkinson's oh this is happening that's Parkinson's and let's just dump it all in this Parkinson's <laughs> bucket 
because that's a lot easier. And the same thing I think happened with, with the pandemic. And when we start to say, oh, the body's capable of having more than one disease or more than one dysfunction and teasing that out, what I tell people is if we diagnose you with hypothyroid and you know some sort of food sensitivity and uh, B vitamin deficiency, now the, the diagnosis of Parkinson's becomes a lot lighter and smaller and we're managing these other symptoms. So when we're talking about EBV, just kind of in general comorbidities, it's really important to test for those, especially if we're seeing the lab values, you know, show up that way. Um, we do have a history of seeing low lymphocyte values in people with Parkinson's disease. And if that continues to show up and monitoring, then that's kind of the next step I take is say, what else is affecting your nervous system? EBV, is it Lyme? Is it, you know, HSV? There's so many potentials yep. out there. Absolutely. And then with EBV, the last thing I want to say is knowing how to test is really important. You know, I'm definitely not the end all be all, but I dove in really deep on this one because so many people come say, I have EBV, I'm on all these supplements, you know, I can't afford it. It's just it's this long rigmarole and I've never seen a reactivated EBV panel run. So remember when you're running EBV panels to do the thorough panel and remember that if they're IgG antibodies and that's not necessarily indicative of a reactivation unless you're running that EBNA. And that one, if that's showing up is more indicative of reactivation, but not 100% um, specific there. So so um, can you tell everybody exactly what that test is you're talking about? Because I think a lot of us are relying on IgG. Yeah, they do. There's the IgG, IgM for the viral right. capsule. IgA, and yeah. there's one more IgG, but then there's a whole other brand and it's the e Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen, the EBNA. And that is also an IgG test. But if that's elevated, that's more indicative of a reactivation. The other ones are more indicative of a past infection. So oh. to kind of determine whether or not you've been exposed or not to whether or not it's actually reactivated in your body, that right. fourth lab test is, is pretty important. Right. Now, one of the things we I, I've been seeing and, and some other practitioners have been talking about is a immune system dysfunction. So we've been running some tests to look at immune system function, like the Cyrex has the lymphocyte map test, and then there's cytokine tests. And that seems to be one strategy to helping patients with some of these reactivated viruses by trying to support the immune system in whatever way it's imbalanced. Right. Yeah, there's there's theories out there that Parkinson's even originates as an autoimmune variant. Um, so what I tell, again, most of my patients, if they have that diagnosis, is that you're, you're a technically under the classification of immune compromise by nature of your disease for whatever reason and however you reflect, it's something to understand for themselves and their family that their immune systems are more vulnerable and need to be protected. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Steve asked about, have we seen an increase of Parkinson's since um, since COVID? And I think in general, we've seen uh, an increase in autoimmune diseases, haven't we? In general, I mean, in my clinic, I can speak to that for yeah. sure. I don't know the, the epidemiology of Parkinson's since COVID. I haven't looked at that data. Um, but Parkinson's has spiked into being the, the leading um, disease in the population. I think that's just by age as our, as our boomers get into that generation and the risk factors have increased in our, in our society, I think. Right. That. And Dr. Vashtani has published a paper showing that um, uh, it, COVID is the most autoimmune reactive virus that exists. So I haven't been in practice long enough to know that, to be honest, because the flu is really old. Um, but <laughs> no, no, he's he's actually done a study to show yeah. the number of different. Yeah. Um, so um, what are some of the most important lab tests for us to do when we're assessing potential patients with Parkinson's? Yeah, I, your, I have a standard lab panel for most of my people with Parkinson's. You know, you're going to do your blood count and your metabolic panel. I usually pair an A1C with insulin. Rarely do I run an A1C by itself anymore. I'll always do A1C with insulin. Again, in the aging population, we tend to see numbers of your hemoglobin and red blood cells. There's a lot of inflammatory anemias happening. So if you need to back up the blood sugar regulation with the fructosamine, that's also something I add on. Um, there is some theories out there because it's metabolic in nature that Parkinson's being, you know, a type three, similar to what we're saying about Alzheimer's disease, type three diabetes. 
Um, an iron panel plus ferritin. Iron is hugely correlated with Parkinson's disease, development of, progression of. Um, so always running a full iron panel with ferritin. I do an extended thyroid and, panel. And by the way, iron generally increases risk, right? Yes. Yep. And elevated iron increases risk. Um, and I have four now in my practice that I've diagnosed with hereditary hemochromatosis for the first time in their life. So it's a non-standard lab and it's, it's just essential for not just neurologic health, you know, cardiovascular health and um, liver health for sure. Um, but then we're looking at an expanded thyroid panel. Um, I do an expanded thyroid panel on everybody who comes in as a first patient. If it's good to go, then we can kind of cool it from there. Um, I look at your B vitamins, B12 and B6 in your folate. Uh, we know that the use of levodopa can deplete the body of folate and B12. Uh, so looking at those for sure. Um, now, vitamin you, do I'm walking for... through my lab for rec, vitamin D and then DHEA with the high sensitivity CRP. Um, uric acid, F2 isoprostines, and an omega check. So that's kind of my standard. And then of course, patient specific, add or subtract. <laughs> and, and uric acid, um, we, we, we've learned from uh, Dr. Perlmutter that um, even slightly elevated uric acid levels above 5.5 are associated with metabolic disease. But for Parkinson's, um, elevated levels of uh, uric acid are actually protective. Isn't that right? They are. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And we see that um, when we avoid dairy, so dairy inhibits uric acid, we actually get an increase in uric acid levels, which are protective for Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful, of course, patient specific, because they can be inflammatory. But um, inosine is a supplement that's commonly used with Parkinson's disease that can boost uric acid levels and um, alleviate some symptoms. Interesting. Is that one that you use? On occasion. And I, I don't have a ton. Mostly, I, I kind of, you know, joke, most of my patients in the aging population have plenty of uric acid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not seeing a big depletion there. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so um, let's talk about some of the most common pharmaceutical approaches. Oh, somebody asked, can you repeat dairy inhibits? Did you say something about dairy? Yeah, dairy will inhibit uric acid. And with there's twofold there. Um, dairy is one of the major food groups that we do recommend avoiding for people with Parkinson's. Um, and when I first started in my practice, you, know, you learn it and you're you're gaining ground here. I was like, let's try to avoid dairy. And here's what we know. Um, and now my poor patients, I'm like, nope, dairy done, get it out. Like we have so much evidence to show it's a risk factor for development of and progression of Parkinson's disease. And then everybody wants to ask about goat and sheep. Uh, and my answer there's, they're never going to do a randomized control trial of cow's milk dairy versus goat milk dairy. So go plant-based if you can, um, and, and boot it out of the house. So it's, those are in pieces of information we're not going to know. Um, and then, so again, we know uric acid is protective. So it's a twofold reason to avoid dairy. We want to boost up those uric acid levels and we have these independent, um, clinical evidence to show the progression can so exist. actually let's pause on the drugs we got a few questions i think we should try to address bernie asks uh about the relationship between head trauma and parkinson's yeah <laughs> <laughs> and 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 bernie, most neurological you know. diseases alzheimer's including yeah, Bernie, I, I appreciate that question. Um, yes, head trauma definitely has a relationship to Parkinson's. It makes it very challenging to treat. Um, a lot of my people with Parkinson's who have a history of uh, TBI or CTE are either medication resistant or their progression is quite fast that it's, it's hard to catch up with. Um, so in that realm, you know, we, we get a huge team on board neuropsychiatry. We have a functional medicine doctor um, that's working on neuroinflammation. Uh, we're doing trials of different Parkinson's medications. And then if it's a motor symptom um, prominent presentation, then I'm usually recommending DBS for some of those folks. Um, but it's it makes it really challenging when there's confounding neurologic trauma happening there. Um, on the testing. Uh, Steve asked about, do you run organic acid testing? On occasion. Yep. So I will check for metabolite function um, or presence in the urine. If I do, I uh, use grape 
pull do I use yes no I use um Dutch I use the Dutch test for that one uh Great Plains at uh PD summer school um but yes we will run oats testing uh on occasion to see how some of those metabolites are are functioning and Sherry asked what are the best neurological tests to run so now we're talking about the neurological exam part which is um se separate from the lab testing oh a phys like for physical exam yes yeah, I assume, that, I assume that's what you mean, Sherry, right? Okay. So yeah, let's assume I'll, I'll that's answer that one. Mean. Yeah, your neurologic test is going to be really important. I always look for cogwheel rigidity. I think that's one that's missed a lot um, in the diagnosis, and it can actually show up a little bit before motor symptoms. So people are diagnosed, but they're not really strong in the motor symptoms, the um, tremor. You'll often see that cogwheel rigidity in their shoulder or elbow joints. Um, and then, you know, the gait analysis is really huge gait analysis, you know, people get diagnosed on their walk all day, every day by neurologists. So having them turn around, you know, walk your normal gait away from me, turn around as fast as you can at the end of the room, come back, heel to toe, you can do the shin slide, um, but making a really thorough gait and posture analysis. Um, I will check gait. What, what, what are the, some of the most common gait um, uh, abnormalities you'll see? Um, shuffling a little bit later on, but that lack of arm swing on one side is really the most early, um, sign okay. there. And then a head tilt, believe it or not. Oftentimes people will have that head tilt to the side that's affected, um, when they're doing their gait analysis. Um, DTRs are always going to be important that repetitive, you know, rapid alternating movements. If you really want to dive in, you can go to the MDS website and learn the UPDRS or just a few tests from the UPDRS. You don't have to be qualified qualified to do the entire test. I nickname it the chicken dance, but you know, it's really this and can you stomp and move your feet as fast as you can so you can check those movements. Um, the finger to nose test will test that intention tremor uh, and coordination. And, and those are really, I mean, those are really the big ones. Oftentimes they'll have people sign their name on a piece of paper and just look for if they're having that agraphia to see if their handwriting has gotten smaller, so. And, and, I, has, and I also use that for signs of improvement. Hey, I need oh, okay. you, you know, let's sign again. Let's see if these things are helping and if we've, we've gotten better control of your motor symptoms. Now, is there a quantitative score patients can get on that neuro test? Or any yeah, the UPDRS is a very detailed, that's what movement disorder specialists are using okay. um, for diagnostic and prognostic testing. Um, it's it's a very useful test when not used in isolation. I think the frustration is, is they'll go in and they'll do excellent at the test and they'll be feeling like shit, you know, and they're like, hey, my neurologist said I'm doing great. I don't need anything else, but I haven't pooped in four days and my anxiety is through the roof. And, you know, here's how I'm really feeling. But my UPDRS was great. So <laughs> again, taking that all uh, into consideration. Right. Always treat the patient. Um, yeah. So um, somebody asked about isoprostane labs. Is it, did you mention it? Yeah, F2 isoprostanes is a urine lab. Uh, and as my mentor told it, it, it tells us how rancid somebody is. And it truly will tell you if there's rancidity in the, in the body and if it's kind of in that toxic state. And that can lead me to say, okay, we need further testing maybe on the toxic levels, um, heavy metals or, or mycotoxins, if there's something else at play here. Um, and I also correlate that with the omega check. Are we getting enough of the omega-3s? Are we getting these anti-inflammatories? And, um, and what is the burden there? When you look at the omega levels, uh, what are you looking specifically what do you focus on the most? Do you just look at the uh, omega-3 index? Do you look at the omega-6-3 ratio? Do you look at the arachidonic acid, omega-3 ratio, the EPA, the DHA levels? What do you think is most significant to focus on? Yes. <laughs> no, really the big one all of those things of course and you're looking at those levels to be in favor of the omega-3 the anti-inflammatory um, markers right. but DAT is is really what's most highly studied in people with Parkinson's and I always say for for DHEA or sorry DHA right. um, it's the four D's and we're looking between two and four grams of DHA at a daily dose to help with these things. And the, and the four Ds we're looking for with Parkinson's disease is de depression, dementia, dyskinesia, and death. And those are big 
those are four big D's that you really want to address. So I have three, you know, nutrients, natural medicines that most everybody in my practice will get prescribed at some point in time early on. And that's one of the biggest ones is because again, the brain's made out of fat. The DHA is the prominent fat in the brain. And we really want to promote that, those high levels there. Uh, what lab do you use for the F2 isoprostate? I run mine through LabCorp and it's a urine lab. So that's the big thing to remember is that's urine. You're not going to find it on a blood panel. Okay. Um, so Steve, you're asking about CoQ10, hold that. We're going to go into drugs and then we'll go into diet and then supplements if that's okay. Um, so can you talk about pharmaceutical approaches to Parkinson's? Yeah. Give me one second here. My... My son's uh, nest just went off or hatch. If anybody knows what a hatch is, and you know. <laughs> uh, pharmaceutical approach to Parkinson's disease. You know, it's it's growing. Uh, there's many, many out there that are that are available. Um, the biggest one that you're most familiar with is Cinemet or Carbidopa Levodopa. Um, my approach to that, I always like to take a couple minutes and talk about it. You know, as a naturopathic doctor, as a functional med physician or practitioner, I'm sure you get most of your patients coming and say, I don't want to take drugs. I don't want to take meds. Give me anything. Um, and then the conversation ensues of if you have somebody who has type 1 diabetes and their pancreas cannot make insulin, the most natural thing and effective thing that you can give to these patients is insulin. You have Parkinson's disease and your body cannot make dopamine. The most natural and effective medicine that I can prescribe to you right now is dopamine. And so we have those conversations and there are natural supplements for dopamine. We're talking about Macuna prurians. Unfortunately, with the supplement industry not being regulated, we are seeing that that dosages cannot be standardized, sometimes even from pill to pill within the same bottle. So when I'm starting somebody on a medicine, I really do promote the use of uh, synthetic carbon levodopa um, because... I mean, we're, we're trying to fill up a bucket blindfolded. We don't know how empty it is. And when we're repleting the body of dopamine, what I'm seeing the most is, is that it's not so much the medicine taking care of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but it's aiding in their ability to do the things they need to do to slow down Parkinson's disease. So again, the non-motor uh, non -motor symptoms like apathy, the lack of motivation to do what they can, um, pain, anxiety. And when we give you know, these patients, the dopamine that they need, then they can kind of start to overcome some of those and go do the exercise and, and eat and prepare their food. Um, not to mention the huge effect it has on motor symptom presentation. Um, so there's a couple different varieties out there, the, your, your immediate release, your extended release, controlled release, cinnamon, Ritari, um, generic. So that's really the first one that we, that we come to the table with. Now, um, um, so, something you told me last time we spoke, which I thought was really fascinating, is um, it's common for patients to be told by their neurologist, let's hold off on starting to take um, dopamine because, or, or carbidopa, levodopa, because it will stop working after a certain period of time. And yep. you have found that when you use a functional medicine approach, that doesn't happen. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. Well, it doesn't you know, happen as often. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the goal is, like I said, when you're taking a whole person approach, the theory out there is that carbidopa levodopa has a 10 year shelf life in the body. You're going to keep increasing the dose until you hit max dose and then it'll start to wear off and not be useful anymore. So what I talk to people about is one, you could get 10 good years out of this. You want to take it? I would, you know, like let's, let's give it 10 good years and let the researchers go do their job to see what else they can come up with in the meantime. Um, and two, the majority of the time, what I see is in that line of thinking or philosophy, let's prescribe this and let's keep increasing the doses, symptoms worsen and worsen and worsen without thinking of, Hey, are you taking magnesium that interferes with levodopa? Hey, do you have a B12 deficiency? Do you have slow gut motility? Are you taking it with protein? Um, do you have CDP choline on board? Are you taking it with vitamin C? Do you have enough hydrochloric acid? The list goes on and on and on how we can make this medicine more effective for our patients. And when that's left out, then we need more and it runs out of efficacy. When it's brought in, that's what I was mentioning before. We see the need for that medicine decrease by up to 50% uh, while still managing symptoms. That's so, awesome. 
It is. It's incredible. And I mean, it's that I've taken people right off the ledge. I'm at max dose. They've got nothing else. They're on four or five different anti-Parkinson's meds. And we, okay, let's, let's pull this back a little bit and they're managing really well. So. Awesome. Okay. Um, so the other, the other medicine I really want to hit on um, that comes right out of the gate from, you know, naturopath's office, which often astounds people is resagiline or Azelect. Uh, it's an MAOB type inhibitor. And why, why I prescribe that or promote that is it's the only pharmaceutical on the market right now with some research to show that it slows disease progression. All of the, the pharmaceuticals at this point in time are there for symptom management. And this is the only one that actually shows a slight improvement in disease progression. So um, again, I look at every single patient as, is it me? Is it my mom? What, what kind of steps do I want to take to slow this disease down and buy all of us idiots over here, more time to do the research and, and figure out what else we can do. Great. Um, uh, my least favorite pharmaceutical, I'll just go right into that if, yeah. if you want me to keep yeah. rambling, um, yeah. are the agonists. Um, the agonists are tough, they're effective, um, but they have a laundry list of side effects that I would say most patients uh, experience. So impulse control, behavioral changes, are really pronounced when we're using those agonists. And they're more most often prescribed for people who have restless leg syndrome or the REM sleep disorder symptoms. And as you all know, I mean, we've got oodles and oodles of tools to use for those symptoms. So again, if we can take those out of the Parkinson's bucket for a hot minute and address those in a different way, then we don't necessarily have to use those medicines um, as often. Um, some non-standard medicines that I really am loving using, especially when we have GI issues, are Embresia. It's an inhaled levodopa, um, and I use that as a rescue, as a rescue medicine. And then you have your new pro patch, um, which also bypasses the gut and can be helpful for, for managing symptoms of Parkinson's. Steven asked if ARBs like Kozar are neuroprotective. It's a good question. I honestly don't know. I'm sorry. I, I can do some research on that if you ever want to email me and I can get back to you. But um, I don't know right offhand if that's a direct correlation. Can you just repeat that, Mad, that you said is your favorite? Yeah, dopamine. Um, no. Cinnamon, but the second, the one that shows disease progression yes. slowing yeah. is Rigagiline or Azelect. Okay, thank you. And interestingly enough, as an MAOB type inhibitor, just fun fact, um, turmeric has properties of an MAOB inhibitor too. So all the other lovely things that we all love turmeric for also shows properties of the MAOB. So I usually awesome. will have some form of turmeric in there. Yeah. One of the most amazing nutraceuticals for sure. Um, yeah. So what about diet? What, what are the most important dietary considerations? Yeah, the most important dietary consideration, as I mentioned to you before, Ben, is uh, a healthy relationship with food. Um, I'm a huge proponent of screening for disordered eating habits, body image dysmorphia. And I I don't know off the hand, of course, you know, I don't have these, but I would say probably 50% of my male and female patients over the age of 65 have battled with some sort of disordered eating, um, whether it's back in their teenage years or in their forties or, you know, and, and men aren't exempt from this, you know, body image for men tends to be this very deep shame issue. So don't not ask, you know, ask first. And if they laugh at you, then great, move on. Um, but those conversations are really important because, when we're talking about neurologic disorders, you know, anxiety and vagal nerve dysfunction are hugely important in the healing process. We need and the restrictive uh, diet specifically for Parkinson's. We need to be able to tell patients don't eat broccoli and cauliflower. And no, I'm no, kidding. eat that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and those exist. Once you pass that gate of can you eat these healthy and it's not going to create stress and anxiety for you, you know, because my motto is if eating the food or not eating the food causes you more stress than the food itself and eat the damn food. Right. Like we can, we can do things to detox the food, but that stress and vagal nerve dysfunction is, is important. But when we're looking strictly at diet, most of the research is coming back to that Mediterranean mind diet that we're really aware of that's been published over and over again. I have a colleague who's an MDS over in Seattle, who's hugely promoting a vegan diet. 
Um, I don't necessarily see that to be true in all of my patients. So we ease our way into it. And if they're really willing to go there, then absolutely, especially if there's cardiovascular risk. Um, but I really start talking about, you know, what to avoid and what to focus on. So my patients will leave my office with, here's your goal. I want seven to nine servings of fruits and veggies. I want you to eat mushrooms. I want you to focus on, you know, wild caught salmon. And by the time they get through the list of what I want them to focus on, they're full. And so it's less about restricting and it's more about let's, let's make your grocery list. Let's make your meal plan with these foods that we really want to get in your system. And that way it doesn't feel so restrictive, but you know, dairy is the big one, pork, um, the red meat definitely has been shown to, in, you know, increase the, the progression. Um, and the other thing that I like to talk about is, is smoothies. You know, what we're asking people to do with the nutrient density and low protein is, can we put it all in a smoothie? There's a lot of people with Parkinson's who have dysphagia, you know, difficulty swallowing. So can we get some of your medication and your supplements in your smoothie with you? How can we make this easier for you to get and assimilate your medicine um, and promote healthy bowels and so, and water, right? Let's add some water to your smoothie. Now we can really amp it up. So, so diet's a huge, huge aspect of health for people. Uh, it's just, it's really touchy and really important. So <laughs> tread with caution. So there's some interesting data on the benefits of exercise for Parkinson's. Yeah. Aerobic exercise, I, I there's some data even for strength training. Yeah, the, the most important thing I think for exercise is it's dose dependent. So when I tell my patients that, you know, we always joke that if I had a pill bottle to give you that said exercise on it, you would take it. Um, but going out and doing it is much more difficult. So when I tell them this is dose dependent, it's dose and frequency dependent is how much you do exercise, how much benefit you're going to get from it. It's a huge motivator for folks. And we are seeing the evidence that if you exercise less than three days a week, there is no benefit in the slowing of progression. So it is a three plus days a week where you're seeing an, an increased benefit in, in symptoms and disease progression. Um, most of the, the, the most studies exercises for Parkinson's disease is going to be things like boxing. There's rock steady boxing programs all throughout the nation. Uh, it's a phenomenal program. It's utilizing both sides of your body. It's a great community. The instructors there are familiar with Parkinson's disease, so they know how to challenge uh, and work with people. And, and then as I always like to say, as a former amateur Golden Glove boxer, you get to hit the shit out of something and get out <laughs> all your frustration. So it, it's a really great um, exercise to go into. Tai Chi is, is deeply um, studied, cycling and dancing. Those are kind of like the top ones that you're going to see in the research. But what I tell people is find something you enjoy to do that challenges your brain because um, it's something new. Get that BDNF going and flowing and do something new and, and do it regularly. Uh, going back to diet, Bernie asked about, what do you think about gluten? Oh, gluten. It's going to be, again, it's going to be patient dependent. Um, I often try to tell people to avoid gluten. Uh, it's going to be under my recommendation to take that out as best as they can. Uh, if we need to need to do deeper studies, I have diagnosed a few people with Parkinson's with celiac disease again in their sixth and seventh decade. Um, I know we all know the stories, but you're talking GI inflammation and that's been going on for that long. So we really, we do try to eliminate or, or avoid gluten as best as we can. Um, and then if, if something where you can't do it, then I will often prescribe a, a digestive enzyme to help break that down. And exercise. Bernie also asked about Pilates as a form of exercise. Yes. I mean, there's not really anything I'm going to say no to uh, as long as it's safe and effective. Um, but one of the, you know, as practitioners, do you get somebody with Parkinson's in? What I really do want to say is, you know, help them build their team. One of the very first referrals that anybody should get with the diagnosis is to a uh, Parkinson specific physical therapist, um, strengthening those intrinsic muscles, reducing the risk of fall, even if they're not there yet is going to be really, really important for everybody. And I think as we, as we recognize that, you know, we need to build this team for our, our patients. That's one of the very first referral. Hey, do you have a referral out for PT? Have you done it? Nope. Okay. Let's get you one. Let's, let's get going on this. Um, building of your of your team and resources. So let's let's go into nutraceuticals. Um, what 
particular nutritional products have you found to be helpful in slowing the progression and and modulating some of the different factors involved? Yeah. So um, what I like to say is people walk into my office with Parkinson's disease, they're typically going to walk out with three natural prescriptions, and that's glutathione, high potency DHA fish oil, and CoQ10. Um, what we're seeing with glutathione, the research dates back to the 80s. I already touched on the deficiency that we're seeing by the time of diagnosis based on motor symptom onset. And as the primary antioxidant of the nervous system, we really need to be um, proactive in and getting that repleted in the body, help with the detoxification system and supporting um, neuroinflammation. I typically don't rely on NAC as a precursor to glutathione. Um, most of the evidence is showing just give them straight up glutathione. Um, IV glutathione has been researched, like I said, since the 80s. It's not accessible. It's invasive. It's painful. And the, the effects aren't always long lasting. And my mentor, Lori Mishley, did some studies on intranasal glutathione. We are seeing a larger increase in, I guess, a larger decrease in symptom presentation patient reported when we use intranasal. Um, the tough part about intranasal is that it's also not as quite as accessible. You have to do that through a compounding pharmacy. And then patients aren't always compliant. It tends to burn a little bit. They have to lay on their back for a couple of minutes and they'll report half of it goes down their throat anyway. Um, but we like intranasal. It's a direct route to the brain. So when possible, it's a really great um, tool to use. Otherwise, I'll use a liposomal oral buccally absorbed glutathione um, to to get that process going for my patients. Um, um, the high, oh, how, do, how did they uh, get the intranasal? You said use a compounding pharmacy and then is it use one of those machines to put it in? They uh, they do that. I send to oh. the compounding pharmacy and then they send them home with the, the inhaler and the spray bottle and everything. Oh, like okay. So they put it in the inhaler. Okay. Yeah. And then um, as far I'm as- Never in my- <laughs> Do you have a particular brand and dosage for the liposomal glutathione that you prefer? Dosage is going to depend patient to patient. Um, I tend to use Designs for Health, the, the pump. Um, that's the one that's been most well absorbed for people. Um, but I use consumer lab reports to run my, my natural medicines through. So again, as a functional or naturopath or integrative provider, um, I think I mentioned to you this before, Ben, like I never thought my epitaph was going to be safely prescribed natural medicines, uh, but I cannot say it enough. We, you know, we have to be the gatekeepers of these medicines. They are not always safe. They're not always indicated. Um, and, and we, and they, they contraindicate with pharmaceuticals. I mean, I don't know how many of you knew that magnesium will inhibit the absorption of levodopa. And the very first thing we want to give somebody for constipation is mag oxide, right? So right. really knowing these interactions and, and understanding your nutraceuticals is, is really important. Um, the DHA fish oil, again, I tend to go liquid on that because you can throw it in a smoothie. You know, it's it's really beneficial. Um, I like I like Pharmax and Genestra. Those tend to be, you know, one to two teaspoons a day to get that high potency dose. What's the dosage about. you like? Two to four grams. Okay. That's really what we're looking of at. DHA. Yep. DHA. Yeah, yeah, DHA. So really understand when you look at the front of the bottle, they don't have to meet label potency, right? So again, this is you know my epitaph that I didn't ask for. Um, but <laughs> the uh and again, patient specific, right? Fish oil is a blood thinner, so we have to be aware of all those of different uh contraindications there. And then CoQ10, you know, we're all recognizing the mitochondrial effect of Parkinson's disease. How I like to frame it to my patient is you're burning a lot more ATP than I am just sitting here because you have a motor um, disease, a motor, uh, what am I looking for? A motor disease. And um, you're going to burn that fuel a lot faster. There's, you know, a ton of other research about CoQ10 and mitochondrial health and Parkinson's disease. But when I'm talking to a patient, this is how I like to say it. Let's keep your gas tank full. If you're going to use it, let's give it to you. Um, it's really hard to make that much. But then we also know that that's, you know, membrane stability and, and providing those resources for the mitochondrial. Um, there's been studies with uh, CoQ10, ubiquinol, up to 900, 1,000 milligrams a day. And the evidence to show symptom improvement isn't there to match. And it's really expensive. So I typically stay between one and 300 milligrams. And I and, like- And uh, did you say ubiquinol versus ubiquinone? Yep. I usually use a ubiquinol instead of like the CoQ10 just for the bioavailability aspect. Okay. And you said 300 milligrams? Between one and three. Between one and three. Okay. 
And by the way, I think the um, the design for health glutathione is private labeled from Quicksilver for whatever that's worth. But <laughs> yep. Um, okay. So what else? Uh, somebody asked me my youngest patient, forty one. Just wanted to answer that on the on the chat, but it was too late to write forty one, so I didn't know if they would know who that was the answer for. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, what about uh, vitamin D? Vitamin D, we like those ranges to be between 40 and 60. Um, I don't get super scared of high vitamin D. I'm always checking that calcium. You can double check a PTH, um, but really ubiquitously, you know, you look at the Venn diagrams of neurodegenerative diseases and vitamin D is implicated in all of them. Um, it's really come out as a shining star after the pandemic too, for immune health. So absolutely vitamin D is something that we check and supplement with patient specific. You mentioned uh, B12. We we all know that B12 is super important for brain health, but um, I personally have found that serum B12 levels are not particularly accurate and tend to rely more on homocysteine and methylmalonic acid. Same. Those are, uh, sorry, and I, I didn't even include those. Those are in my... Um, lab order, the very okay. first ones. I do run an MMA and I run a homocysteine. Absolutely. Um, you know, we know there's B12 in the blood, but are we using it is is the question, right? So right. we want to check those homocysteine levels. We know homocysteine elevation. And the interesting thing is I actually have a lecture up if you, you know, go to either my website or Northwest Parkinson's Foundations, where I did a lecture just on lab values and reference ranges. So we take these standard reference ranges that are made for, you know, white men age 40 to 50 and say, <laughs> doesn't apply, you know, maybe to you, Ben, but doesn't apply to most of us uh, or most of our patients. So we narrowed in those reference ranges based on the clinical data that we have to say, here's what our goal is. And in the literature, we know that homocysteine above 11, above 11 can be neurotoxic, yet the reference range on most labs is 14, 14.9. So the goal for people with Parkinson's is below 10. Yeah. I just had a patient yesterday with a homocysteine of 90. <laughs> oh. I know. Yeah, you don't even have to test MTHF on that guy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you got, you got homo homozygous there. Um, um, yeah, so we're definitely those those B vitamins. And interestingly enough, you know, like I talk about, we we all know if you prescribe metformin, you dose B12. Like these are things that aren't happening. If you're going to prescribe levodopa, you prescribe B12. We know that it depletes the body of B12. Other things that can elevate homocysteine levels, not just B12 and folate, but B6 and betaine. So there is a product out there that I really like um, called homocysteine factors. Super easy. Um, yeah, I use the Designs for Health product, homocysteine supreme, but there's a lot of similar products out there. Yep, it's great, but be cautious with your B12. Again, neuropathy is a really common symptom um, of people with Parkinson's and too much B6 because a lot of our patients come in on these, their self-prescribed medicines can actually cause that as well. So, um, you know, checking labs, making sure that you're, you know, not putting everything in this one box, right? There could be a lot of different aspects at play. There's a lot of clinical research out there about high dose of B1. I kind of wanted to hit on that. I have had four patients who went into some trials with that. Only one saw benefit. So I'm not dogging it. I'm just, yeah, I don't think it's going to do a whole lot of harm and people often will burn out from not seeing the effects um, or maybe have a few side effects from it. But I'm really interested to see what else comes down the pipe about um, high dose thiamine supplementation. Uh, low dose lithium has some data. Oh my gosh. Lithium has so much data. Um, either hair or urine tests. I prefer a urine test for lithium, um, but that is definitely something to test. You know, there was a, um, what I'm thinking, not a protest, but a motion to actually lithiumate water in the Pacific Northwest at one time, like we do. Oh, really? Yeah, because there's so much deficiencies. And if you look through the literature, low lithium levels are correlated with a lot of neurologic diseases, including schizophrenic and bipolar disease. And, you know, so the list goes on. Um, but yes, low lithium levels are often implicated with people with Parkinson's. And lithium is an important cofactor for BDNF, the brain-derived neurotropic factor. So we like lithium. I prescribe lithium. Um, you'll often get a side eye from your conventional counterparts. 
And how I usually phrase it to patients and put it in their notes, this is a physiologic dose of lithium. This is not a pharmacologic dose of lithium. Um, you can always check their blood levels or their urine levels again. And it also has um, evidence to show that it helps with dystonia or that muscle cramping and pain that can happen in off periods. So I really like lithium. I would say after my top three, that's probably my next most prescribed uh, nutraceutical. Um, I, I looked up other nutraceuticals. Uh, there was some data on resveratrol and also lycopene. Yep. Like, I haven't actually heard about the lycopene thing, to be honest. Um, but antioxidants, you know, if you put a big umbrella there, the antioxidant use is going to be huge. Those bioflavonoids. I really like resveratrol. You know, you can prescribe that. Or you can really dive into food. Once they start meeting some of those food goals, they're going to be getting some of those nutrients um, naturally. Um, and spices, you know, we really can't pass up the importance of spices in our life and, and how they affect our health. And that's where we can get a really good, healthy dose of resveratrol. So no, I like I, <laughs> you've talked about inflammation. We know that's a really important factor. Um, we've been using the um, SPMs, you know, the fish oil derivatives for inflammation. What do you think about those? I haven't used those before. It's a good question, but I'd, I'd like to learn more. So if you can shoot me a, a message, okay. about that, I'd love to learn more about that. You got it. What about some of the uh, supplements that are specifically for brain function? You did mention citicoline. Do you have a dosage you like for that? Yeah. And it's interesting. The Neurologics is a product that I use. You mentioned by IT. Oh, okay. They also have a product called Pearl Thrivers Wellness, and that has Lion's Mane in it. Um, right. So I really like their Pearl Thrivers Wellness brain, um, brand. Again, I have no conflict of interest here. Um, I'm not sponsored. But, you know, the, the formula there, Lion's Mane has a huge batch of research behind it for cognitive uh, support and immune function. And then the CDP choline that's involved in that formula is at a two caps twice a day. So you're getting 250 milligrams. Um, so that's a really great proponent to use. And we're using that for cognitive function. Anyway, a lot of people are supplementing with it. What we're seeing with people with Parkinson's specifically in this population is when we dose citicoline with carbidopa levodopa, we're seeing enhanced efficacy of the medicine. So again, another way that we can reduce dose or the need for dose and expand that 10 year time frame out and with continued use of citicoline, we're actually seeing an improvement of 30 to 50% efficacy in four to six weeks. Wow. So it's pretty, it's pretty great evidence there and in, in, in support. And what dosage? 250 milligrams. Okay. And I, I'm going to say twice daily. Twice have, a day. Yep. Okay. What about some of the other specific brain formulas? Like uh, there's vinpocetine, there's... Um, there's a whole bunch of them out there. There's, yeah, there's, there's a ton of that. If we're talking cognitive function and, you know, DLB, things like that, that are starting, you know, now you're kind of diving into a whole different approach, I would say, in right. that realm. So really diving into the mushrooms, into the nutrients, um, you can do some intermittent fasting and, you know, those are, I take a way more aggressive approach with those folks for sure. Um, I often will use a proteolytic enzyme for somebody who has like DLB or any sort of inflammatory aggregates. If it's safe, something like natokinase, um, that's going to help with some of those inflammatory markers. Um, but some of the other, what do you say? Cognitive. I I'm a big herbalist gal. I love my herbs. They work really well. So the ginkgo, rosemary, and bacopa, um, go to cola or centella. Those herbs are powerful, they're robust, and they're multifaceted. But when you're talking nootropics, um, in my opinion, you can't get much better than, than herbal medicine for some of those functions. Just and then we can, you know, we can customize formulas then, right? We can use those and we can add in some cardiovascular tonics and some anxiolytics like kava or skull cap and help with urinary frequency. So it's really fun to, to formulate on that level and, and make sure that we're getting those herbs in there. Uh, you know, and then you get your adrenal support when we're talking cognitive function. Now you're diving into that vagal nerve dysfunction. Um, how's your dysautonomia? You know, how's your blood pressure? How's your stress response? Um, are you screening for ACEs? You know, have you talked to your patients about their adverse childhood events or traumatic history? 
a huge portion of my people with Parkinson's will come into my practice say, hey, when did this start? I got diagnosed five years ago. No, when did this start? Well, you know, I got divorced 15 years ago or I lost my mom 20 years ago or, you know, there's this trauma in their life and then they can start to see how their health declined and we can kind of trace it back to something like that. So, you know, when we're practicing root cause medicine, even if we can't change the root, it's important to address it and have that conversation. You mentioned a vagal nerve several times. In my office, we've been experimenting with using a laser to stimulate the vagal nerve. And somebody came by my office today and demonstrated this electrical stimulation machine that's been shown to uh, work on the vagal nerve and have therapeutic benefits. Have you uh, experimented with anything like that? Yeah, I prescribed a couple of vagal nerve stimulators. You know, I use the earlobe technique um, with the stim machines. Um, but really, it's, I, I follow Dr. Stephen Porches in his polyvagal theory and tracing our breath work. You know, we know that when we exhale, we stimulate the vagus nerve. You know, vagal nerve function is not passive. It's intentional in the body. We could cut it and survive. So when I tell people that the intention to stimulate it and put yourself in the parasympathetic nervous system is intentional and our exhales are going to stimulate that vagus nerve. So doing a four, seven, eight breath technique, um, humming, uh, gurgling water, contrast hydrotherapy, right? Contrast showers can stimulate the vagal nerve function. So there's a lot patients can do in their lifestyle that doesn't necessarily add to their plate of go do this or put this buzzer on or, you know, take a supplement or something like that. Um, and then, you know, finding a biofeedback practitioner, if it works, finding a counselor, really addressing um, the mental, emotional aspect of Parkinson's. Again, I mean, you guys all know as well as I do in this, in this field of medicine, people walk in and say, Oh, you know, my doc said it's all in my head. I said, cool. Your head's attached, right? Let's, <laughs> let's work on that. Like, let's, let's do something about that. And, and more often than not, you talk about this hypervigilance or, you know, amygdala overactivation. And once we start working on that too, we see gut motility improve. So there's, there's so much that we can do as, as functional medicine or integrative medicine providers, um, that supports a patient's well-being and quality of life. Um, with Parkinson's. Wendy asked, are you accepting new patients uh, out who don't live in Idaho? Yes. Yep. I do telemedicine and I accept patients from wherever they want to come from. That's great. Um, so, I, on there. so those are pretty much the questions that I had prepared. Is there anything else you wanted to talk to us about? I think oh, well, we that's pretty much covered it. How are we going to be here till midnight for some of these? Okay, great. No, so, I mean, really, yeah. the biggest thing I want to say, Ben, is you know, the, the biggest thing I say is I'm passionate. The more people we have with information to treat Parkinson's, you know, I don't, I don't want all the referrals, I want everybody to have the information. So, uh, Lori Mishley has an online training program that you can go on. Um, through how, how, do, you, how do you spell her name? Mishley, M I, I'll put it in the chat box. Okay. I can type it better than I can spell it. Okay. <laughs> um, Lori Mishley. Um, so there's a ton of resources out there. You know, if it seems like too much, right, to take on somebody with Parkinson's, um, then find somebody who is familiar with it because we are trying to create this whole, you know, group of people who understand the integrative approach and who want to do more research on it and more boots on the ground, as Lori likes to call it. So, you know, if you're seeing these people and you have questions, I mean, reach out to me. I, I'm happy to share my email, my website. Um, I want, I'm collegial. I'm nice. I like to think I'm charming on occasion. So <laughs> you know, reach out, Very ask questions, so. present cases. That's what I said. When I make bad jokes, I need to see if people laugh or not. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, please, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was an awesome presentation. And um uh, you put your um, you, your website, which is cdahealingarts.com, how people can contact you, right? That's the best way. It is. And Ben, just really quick, I see that Bernard wrote a couple times here, summarize the causes of PD. I can summarize it really quick. We do not know. Um, unfortunately, you know, the Parkinson's diagnosis is um, IPD, idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So there's a lot of theories from autoimmune um, to metabolic, to obviously genetic, environmental toxicity. And what I'm seeing in my practice, you know, with you know, the hundreds now of people that have accumulated is a combination of all of it. So as much as I wish I could say, here's the causes, 
if I did, I'd be a Nobel Peace Prize winner and I wouldn't be sitting here talking <laughs> to you guys. So. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Thank you all for being here. Please reach out, ask questions, send emails. I thank you for the work you're all doing. Great. And we'll see everybody next month. Yeah, I'm excited for Dr. Bredesen. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'll make sure to add your name to the mailing list. Uh, please do. You got some you got some big names there, man. I was sweating <laughs> when we started. I was like, what are you talking to Dale Bredesen? Like, what am I doing here, man? This is... <laughs> This was awesome. Thank you. And at home, took a shot of whiskey before I signed down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or, and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So, if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111, and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.